Goedenavond. Good evening. The rain is not really helping us for the acoustics. It is um, irrigating and a little bit irritating, I suppose, but we'll manage. Uh, this talk will be in English. Um, but in the end, if you would like to discuss in Dutch, we will be glad to translate your questions or your remarks. So, um, wel welcome um, to the first evening of the Articulate Research Days. As you know, these res Can you understand me at the back? Yeah, okay. If not, just wave. Eh? Um, as you know, these days are actually meant to open up this course, to um, set you free from the studio, and to discuss together with other students and researchers new ideas. Ideas on art practice, art education, but also um, on art topics relating to politics, society, ideologies, and even uh, activism. Um, last year, um, Nico Dox here of Expanding Academy and Judith Wielander there invited some uh, curators and uh, pedagogues who were presenting to us alternative ways of teaching art. Uh, we were discussing last year nomadic art schools and so on. This year the topic will be about art touching upon activism and where places can be created where hospitality meets pedagogy and where the new art can meet new forms of activism touching upon uh, urgent situations in current society. Um, Nico and Judith invited um, four people connected with two collectives. We will be presenting tonight a trampoline house and living room. And each of the uh, founders and curators involved will present both uh, projects. Um, in the end, we will also touch upon Expanding Academy and how the ideas presented here today touch on contemporary art education. Because as a school, we ask ourselves every day how to teach art in current society, which is shifting very dramatically and very quickly, and how we can be relevant as an art school for today's art and today's society. Um, first of all, I would like to have the members uh, of the panel uh, present themselves, in person, that is. And then afterwards, uh, each of the collectives, uh, trampoline house and living room, will uh, present their project, actually. And afterwards, there will be plenty of time uh, for us to ask questions to each other. I suppose there might be some. But also, of course, from you present here, uh, to ask questions to the panel. Um, in the end, we will also present a book which will be given to you tonight for free, which contains uh, interviews and writings about the two projects presented today. So if you want to have more details on the things discussed and also on the CVs of uh, the guests today present, you will find them in this uh, nice book, uh, the first of a series uh, published by Expanding Academy, which is by uh, Nico and uh, Judith. Uh, the title of the book is, as the title of today, Radical Hospitalities, Radical Pedagogies. So, uh, maybe first of all, we should see who is present here. And I would like to ask uh, the people in person to present themselves, and then afterwards we will go on to discuss uh, the projects that you are involved in. Morten? Uh, hello everybody, I'm Morten Gold from uh, Tramplin House in Copenhagen. Very short. <laughs> That's <I'm> so <laughs> short. <laughs> yeah. I will try to be as, uh, as short as well. Uh, I'm Sara Alberani, I'm based in Rome, Italy, and I'm part of Tramplin House as independent curator. And as a curator, I work with socially engaged art practices. Among them, there is Tramplin House as one of the main projects that I'm following. Yeah, I'm, I'm Sandy Hilal. Uh, it, it's, I mean, I, I have a very complex identity, so it's not easy to do it in one second, but I can try. I mean, I am a But you have all the time you need, huh? 
I have time, <laughs> right? I mean, I can make it longer. Uh, I, I, I have been trained architect and in some way um, willing to act through architecture in the world, I found in art the only refuge where it's possible to act in, for certain projects. So some of my projects are completely architectural projects, but others where it's so hard today to act in real life because there is no room for these places, refuge in art has been a major important part. So, and, and I'm part of a collective called DAR, and DAR stands for, decol in English, stands for decolonizing architecture, art, research, or residency, because we both live together and research together. But dar in Arabic means on, also home. So in somehow the idea of, of being part of a practice where home is at the center of uh, uh, that practice. So, and, and yeah, I will be happy to share with you uh, why, why home in somehow. Thank you for the invitation to be here today. My name is Zoe Bart. I'm a curator and a writer recently moved to Chiang Mai in Northern Thailand. I am a Hong Kong British, Australian passport holder who left the museum world after 10 years of realizing I felt like a fraud in the system of commissioning and creating exhibitions with artists and works representing political poverty coming out of communities where their narratives and their works are actually never seen. Indeed, they were transported out of those localities, showcased in foreign museums, but never taken home. And since then, I've decided to work with artist-driven initiatives in China, Vietnam, and now Thailand. And throughout the course of the last 20 or so years, I've had the fortune of developing and learning with artists in really deep, discursive, dialogical fashion. Talking is a major part of how I conceive curatorial practice. And that's where Sandy and I connect deeply on the Living Room Project. And as friends, firstly as friends, we connect in certain forms of storytelling that to me are incredibly crucial to the 21st century. And I think I'll leave it there. I think you'll hear from us as to why these forms are so important to us as a group, even to Trampoline House. Okay, we will have to shout. Eh? Yeah. Nature is against us tonight, huh? or with us. Yeah. So, uh, Sarah and Morton, uh, would you please um, elaborate a bit on Trampoline House, mm -hmm. where uh, it came from, how it started, what its aims are and were, and how it will be continued? Yeah. Uh, hello, I hope you can hear me. Um, I brought a few snapshots uh, because uh, uh, it's a very complex uh, story, uh, Trampoline House, but I can say that we, it grew out uh, of an artistic practice um, and uh, it ended up at Documenta uh, and uh, in a way in Denmark at least that was proof that it is art. Um, but now I'll show you these uh, pictures and uh, and then uh, we can get to the uh, nuts and bolts afterwards. Just uh, please. <coughs> uh, the house was... Uh, uh, this version of the house was 530 square meters where uh, we uh, operated as a community center uh, called uh, the Trampoline House. And it was um, um, a territory that we felt was needed because uh, the public discourse around asylum seekers and refugees and colored people uh, was of such a nature that we felt it was unproductive to even try to have um, like a, a public opinion about it. So we decided we needed to reboot the dialogue and we wanted to reboot the dialogue by We wanted to reboot the dialogue <laughs> by, uh, uh, and this is disconcerting. We are dry, we are dry, we're safe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we needed to reboot that dialogue by uh, 
creating a space, a safe space for people who lived in the asylum camps and for Danes who were tired of uh, discussing or you know, being in the, uh, in the general society in order to, uh, to see if we could together create a better form of democracy. Uh, and it, the good part about having a house with walls is that you can decide the rules inside the house. And that's why we talk about territory. And we're probably going to talk more about territory. But please, uh, next. Uh, and these, these are just images of the house, so you get an impression of what was going on. You see here, uh, at some point in 2017, where we really needed to clean up the kitchen. So uh, there was a group of volunteers uh, every time we had uh, projects like that or like anything, it was always teams of um, you know, Danish volunteers working together with uh, people who lived in the camps. Um, and the idea was to um, uh, create a space of equality where we could sort of de-victimize or, you know, it's not something people, they, um, they assume uh, agency when uh, when the, when, the, when the social dynamics are right for it. Uh, so, next please. Uh, and here you see, uh, it's a Sisters Cuisine, it was a catering business that we had at some point, where uh, uh, women from the camps were cooking, and they were actually quite successful creating uh, uh, a business, uh, catering to uh, like uh, ministries and uh, municipalities that thought it was really hot with this uh, initiative because it smelled like integration and they didn't realize that these people were actually uh, illegal uh, because they were not allowed to be uh, volunteers even because they have no work permit. Uh, next please. Uh, this is just uh, like dinner time in the uh, Trampen house. And uh, next please. And this is from uh, an opening of the uh, exhibition space camp, which you see here. Um, it was part, uh, part of the uh, Trumpet House was a gallery space uh, where uh, we had um, uh, lots of different exhibitions, all related to uh, uh, immigration and uh, refugee issues. Uh, next, please. And this is from a party also somewhere in 2018. Uh, and I think, uh, next please. And this is from uh, the Corona lockdown. It was a sad moment because at that point uh, I was working hard to uh, do the fundraising uh, because we were facing a bankruptcy and uh, walking around in these uh, empty spaces with um, you know, if we knew that people wanted to get back to the house, but not possible because of Corona. And then I knew that uh, the economy was just going down the drain. Um, so uh, it's a very emotional picture for me. But you see here, that's the uh, entrance to the gallery. And uh, this is actually uh, an artwork from one of the exhibitions, uh, the, uh, the map. I forget the name, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, next one. Du kan kigge på mig. Jeg har en. Jeg har en, der hedder fase 1, 2, 3. Fase 1, 2, 3. Ja. Jeg kan ikke huske nogen af dine. Jeg ved, hvad forskellen er. Ja. Hun sagde meldepligt. Samtale med udlændingsstørrelse eller interview. Ja. Vi skal selvfølgelig huske public money. Det kalder vi lommepenge. Curfew. Siger det endnu? Ja, ja man, skal være, man skal være hjemme på en specifik tid, så man skal være hjemme ja. rundt om kl. 11, ellers ja. slukker det hele ned. Ja. 10, 10. Nej, 10. 10. Er det 10? Mm -hmm. Ja. Jeg tror det var 11. Også for eksempel øhm, mad. Mm -hmm. Der er faste madtider, ikke også? Mm. Ja, det er fordi, der er forskellige problemer, der er, så der er sådan to til hver. Ja. Vil du ikke nå at få mad? Fordi jeg kan huske for eksempel, da jeg skulle i skole. Så kunne jeg ikke nå at få mormad, fordi jeg skulle i skole før. Mormad er fra kl. 20 til kl. 8. Ja, og jeg skulle altid gå før. Hej, Gia. Hej. Velkommen til. Tak, tak. Jeg hedder Malak. Hanne. Hanne. Malak. Hanne. Hej. På det her øh, dokument, jeg kommer til at give jer, der har vi oversættelser. 
på de diskussioner, vi har haft omkring de her ord, vi har diskuteret, der har noget at gøre med livet på et asylcenter. Ja. Øhm, så du får lige det her, og du får det her. Tak. Og jeg skal hellere lidt, og jeg gerne komme ind og sidde. Fase 1, 2 og 3. Wenn man nach Dänemark kommt, bekommt man seinen Ausweis und dann ist man in der Phase 1. In der Phase 2 wird man zu einem Interview bestellt. Da sitzen dann welche von der Polizei und fragen dich, warum du nach Dänemark gekommen bist, was deine Probleme sind. Dann musst du auf, dann musst du auf einen Brief mit einer Antwort warten. Wenn du in der Phase 2 kommst, bekommst du mehr... Now we are uh, in the weekend Trumpen House, and this is after the bankruptcy. Uh, we are we're invited to Documenta uh, right around the time when we went bankrupt. And uh, uh, we used this uh, not to be completely uh, 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 like depressed, uh, and then to relaunch uh, the house in Copenhagen as the weekend Trumpen House at a much um, smaller budget. And uh, here we are in a congregation hall uh, in, an, in a migration church. Um, where we are doing a workshop for uh, for the uh, documenta show. Um, so um, anyway, next, I think we are probably at the end. You have another one? Yeah. Is it okay? So I I just want to throw out a few uh, uh, words for your uh, sort of a, to raise your curiosity maybe. It's, and we don't have a lot of time here, so I'm gonna throw it out there and uh, maybe people have questions about it. Uh, uh, some people have asked, what is the artistic proposition in this uh, project? And um, the way I see it, the, uh, the purpose, if you want to understand the artistic proposition, you always have to look for, like, what is the function? What is, the real, what is it that you want uh, to express? And what we try to f achieve with Trampen House is a social dynamic where each individual that enters the collective get a chance to reach his or her um, potential. And uh, it's kind of, you know, we, we try to create a zone of becoming. Um, and this is, you know, in opposition to what is happening in the camps, where you are in the zone of the non-beings, because you are dehumanized and uh, you are, uh, uh, you know, left to wait while your life withers away. Um, so the zone of uh, becoming is kind of a really important place for people who are facing this de dehumanizing uh, experience. Uh, you could ask then, uh, what is the zone of the, um, of the beings? And there is actually a zone of the beings, that's when you get a bank account. Um, in this capitalist world, uh, that's kind of one of the marks. Uh, but uh, I think we're uh, trying to achieve a little more than just a bank account with Trump and House because it's about creativity, it's about uh, becoming, it's about, uh, you know, getting networks, so you know where to go. Um, and uh, if you want this to be, um, the, the, like the achievement of or what the artwork is doing, then you have to start looking at how do we, uh, how do we create an environment that, at, that uh, achieves that? And that's where we can start looking at the aesthetics. But uh, I'm going to stop there, uh, and then I'm going to leave it to uh, my companion yeah. here. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Morten. Um, from now on, uh, we will look at the participation of Champlain House to Documenta 15. I don't know how many of you have been there in Documenta 15. Maybe we can talk about this later, because we do think that not only for us, really participating there actively has been uh, a very important experience. So as Morten was saying, the invitation to uh, participate to Documenta arrives in a very fragile moment of the house because for a, a deliberate lack of funds, uh, the house was losing uh, most of the public funds because Corona became more important 
refugees and asylum seekers. And I say a deliberate public uh, uh, lack of public funds because also the sustainability will be an important yeah, okay. <laughs> An important, I think, uh, argument also with uh, Sandy and Zoe uh, tonight because these practices uh, don't really found yet uh, their place in the art system. Um, and this was, uh, we were struggling a lot uh, with the invitation to be part of Documenta because it, this can be a double knife, can be a great opportunity because it was a glue uh, for the community in a very fragile moment uh, to stay together even if we were losing our own territory and also keeping the enthusiasm and the energy and the economy. But in the other hand, the very question was how to deal with daily activities and document a task, how to handle the pressure to exhibit daily uh, activities, how to translate complex methodologies and informal methodology into an exhibition space. So these are all questions that we can see here. This was the installation of trampoline house in Hubner, industrial area. And uh, we can uh, go with the next uh, yeah, picture. So you can see this is what it is. This is a living room. This is what the house is in the reality. So creating a space in which people can rest, in which people can sit down, can listen, to, can watch to the television, can be into a sofa, can also interact uh, with a space in which the main message, we can go to the next picture. The main message was, a very violent message. There was this wall that was asking, uh, this is what you are facing when seeking asylum in Denmark. So Denmark as UK uh, are the, the one of the most violent uh, European countries in terms of asylum policies nowadays. Because we can go with the next, if you are um, an asylum seekers, uh, next, uh, photo. Uh, for example, you are not <coughs> entitled to public education if you are over 18 years old. You live very far away from, um, from the city and you are into detention camp in which you cannot cook your own food. You cannot work, you don't have money and basically you are in a prison as the Ministry of uh, Migration was, was claiming, we are killing them softly. Like, really, mental disease, uh, mental illness is uh, something that really appears. So, the very question was, how uh, can people dismantle the idea that Denmark is a perfect democracy? And it is the stereotype of the perfect democracy among Europe. And in the other hand, also, how to uh, the question of uh, disappear inside the camp can be reversed into uh, become visible, very visible uh, in these installations. So we are in castle. The community cannot travel. Rejected asylum seekers don't have the permit to travel. So we face uh, also the question of the privilege. We are a group of 12 members, both European citizens and both people with migratory background, and only the European can attend most of the activity online because we have an internet connection, because we have the possibility to understand, to speak in English, because we have many, 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 many other things, and because we can travel. So, and next photo, please. Yeah, the main purpose was to uh, really have all the voices, faces, videos, writings, dress, uh, poems, and uh, also puppets that were coming from workshop 
made directly by users of the house and rejected asylum seekers in the camp so that the absence was very visible inside that space of documenta through their own voices. And this is also next, please. This is uh, Shakira Mukomozoni. She's coming from uh, Congo. She's one of the most active members, uh, both in the house and both in the group. And she was, for example, interviewing the kids inside the camp in order to have a witness of uh, how the life is there. But she's a great activist, so the way in which she was presenting her work, uh, we, we can define that, uh, that she can be an artist in that sense because she was really using the video uh, for this very occasion and learning to use the video a lot uh, in order to, to spread that message. And next, so this is the, what maybe we can see after is the video that Morten was talking about, the di dictionary camp. So it is the language uh, speaking by uh, the kids inside the camp that we call that also the trampoline house English. So how to share the knowledge about the camp it, it was a really another question there. And next, this is uh, Khalid al -Bain. Uh, work uh, that is based in many stories that you can listen in the tunnel that brings you to the east part of Castle. Next. And Daddy De Maximo um, is another member of the group. Uh, he is uh, a designer, he is a stylist, uh, and he has uh, done this fashion show in the very center of Castle. He, has, he was able to produce his own collection. Uh, thanks to the documenta participation. Next. Yeah, this is also, uh, again, the fashion show. Next. And so this was one of the, um, the, the two years that we have shared together online. <laughs> It was really tough. Uh, the invitation by Ruan Grupa, the curator of Document, arrived during the pandemic. So the collective were coming mostly from the global south of the world, from very different areas. And the only way in which to exchange uh, things, a methodology, uh, were online. You see here the Lumbun structure. What does it mean? It means uh, not a concept, the Lumbung. It was really a methodology and a practice. So to share an alternative structure to the one of the art system was really the mission uh, at that time. So trying to organize ourselves through Lumbung, economies, money, gallery, press, land, uh, kiosks, interlocal, it means that uh, with the occasion of Documenta, what we are trying to do it was really to create an alternative to the institution itself. And we can speak about this later. This is really interesting. Next one. Yeah, uh, you see a moment in which, for example, we were also singing and dancing together because uh, I think it was really important, the cur curatorial approach that is based on values instead uh, of competition. For what we know, the art is very competitive for everyone. It can be exhausted. We exhaust ourselves a lot. <laughs> and what does it mean uh, to have been selected as a project because for your own values, like joy, for example, friendship, solidarity, or generosity, or sustainability, or many other uh, you want to say something? Well, yeah, finish your sentence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's finished. Please go. <coughs> okay, uh, I think the movie is uh, ready now. Not? Okay. Well, then I, I uh, rest my case. <laughs> 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 no, but I'm almost done. Sorry if I'm taking a lot of time. And uh, next one, please. So this, for example, is a collaboration that with another Lumbum member that is called Project Artworks uh, and is working with a neurodivergent artists. They are based in the UK. And what we discovered together uh, working in the same group that was called Lumbung Interlocal, 
uh, it was that the methodologies that we share were quite similar in the way in which they work through uh, with system of oppression and control both for asylum seekers and neurodivergent people in the way in which you don't have access to the public sphere, in the way in which you are invisibilized, you are victimized, you are paternalized a lot, and in the other hand, creating structures of care and of methodology in which to visualize the person that is at the very center of a circle, as we see. This is a workshop that we have done directly in Trampoline House. And the person at the very center uh, is where the oppression is all around you. And if you go, trying to go outside is where you imagine uh, your autonomy, your self-determination in uh, a position that is very oppressive for you. So we have learned a lot from both the methodologies. And next picture, next one. <laughs> next one, please. And this is how, for example, uh, the traces of the workshop that we were able to held in the house. I repeat this a lot because for us it was key to use the Documenta invitation in order to give back to Copenhagen and the community directly the opportunity to have the activities and the money also spent there. So this is how, for example, the cosmologies of care were then arriving to Castle. Next one, please. And this is another question that I, I mm, want to bring in also for uh, after uh, discussion is how to activate for 100 days a space that is both an exhibition space but both represents the house. So here is uh, Shakira Mukomozoni doing her home workshop with occasional visitors. So uh, as a curator for the first time, I have experienced in an exhibition space occasional visitors staying there, spending with us hours talking about the ideal asylum system, really working together and giving a lot of attention of what is going on, that it, I have to be honest, this is quite surprising, <laughs> uh, that is happening inside an exhibition space as well. So the very question is how the community can be there. Not only the artworks, is an institution ready to host uh, permanently a community? Is uh, an institution ready to support a community that cannot travel, that have uh, a lack of rights in order to move uh, herself inside this very competitive art system. Yeah, I think, yeah, is the last one. Thank you. Morten, you want to add something? I may, maybe I should add, um, <coughs> Um, what I wanted to add, uh, and then show the movie, but uh, I'm not sure we're going to see the movie, but maybe it will. Uh, the, the reason why I thought it was interesting with this movie is because um, you see that it's the voices of the people who uh, live in the camps. Uh, our problem when uh, we were uh, invited for Documenta was that, um, I mean, this idea of collectivity is actually something that we have been working with for 12 years. And by being invited to Kassel, we had this uh, issue with uh, the passports because most of the people in our community, they're not allowed to travel because they are seeking asylum or they re even rejected asylum seekers. So uh, in a way, uh, this invitation was almost tearing us apart as a community because the privileged people, they can go while uh, those who are fucked up, they are like uh, fucked up once again. Uh, or fucked over. Uh, now, um, we were discussing a lot how to deal with this problem uh, because it, I mean, it's actually, 
it's for real that it will tear the community apart. Um, and then we realized that the only way we could defend going to Documenta was to turn uh, this installation into a giant megaphone where uh, the voices from the camps could be heard. So we had to uh, uh, do the community this service. Uh, so this way um, it kind of defined uh, a lot of what was going on. Um, and all, all the uh, videos, they are uh, addressing these issues from, with the voices from the camps. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, before we go to a living room, I just have one specific question about a trampoline house. Um, Morten, you're, you're an artist. Could you explain very briefly uh, what triggered you and other people to found Trampoline House? Where does it actually come from? Because you're now discussing the end and the continuation and, and the relationship with Documenta as an institution. But actually, what was the root of Trampoline House? And what was your position as an artist yeah. within the rooting? Mm -hmm. Briefly. Yep. Oh. Um, around 2008, uh, Denmark was a very depressing place for uh, artists who worked with uh, um, socially engaged artistic practice because the public discourse was uh, marked by the uh, 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 mis not misogyny <laughs> well also that <laughs> but uh, but the uh, uh, you know scare of the refugee um, and we felt that it was actually uh, a problem for democracy that we have decided to put people in camps because we're so scared of them so um, the uh, the answer for us was if we want to save and reboot democracy, then we need to go to the camps and ask for their advice. Because in any democracy, you have to, you have to talk to the people who are really disenfranchised, if, if, you, need, if you want to find a way to improve, right? Um, and we did that by creating a, an asylum dialogue tank, a think tank, where we named the asylum seekers the experts. And, and we were there to learn a group of artists and then uh, the outcome was that they told us, you have to create uh, the trampoline house, or we have to create the trampoline house. And then was a uh, trampoline house founded by, funded by the government as an art project or as a social project? The budgets, for instance. It was never, it was founded by the government in a short period of time, like uh, two years, but uh, mostly it has been private founding. And, and then also, uh, you know, private givers, like regular people who, who sent like 10 euros a month or something. Uh, crowdfunding principle? Yeah, no. it's just that uh, you, you have them on subscription. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, we go to the next project, living room project, uh, Sandy and Zoe. Uh, and afterwards we can take some teams that you share and discuss them with uh, the public uh, in the room. Sandy, the floor is yours. Yes. Uh, um, first of all, thank you uh, very much for creating um, this occasion for us to come and, and I would like, is it okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I will begin shouting in a few minutes. This is how, <laughs> how I work. But if in, in some way, I, I would really love to thank you for um, bringing maybe me and Zoe together and it has been two days that we are here and we laugh about it that we did not stop talking except when we were sleeping so and somehow and and we feel that it's not enough so what we will be sharing with you is really really a minimum fraction of what we have been trying to think about because in in what we are trying to do we have a feeling that we do not have a proper vocabulary and we don't know how to speak about it what does that mean so for us this encounter is also to think together and mainly to share doubts because if i would say the living room stands on something it is around what does it mean to be suspicious in a productive way and in that sense this is where i would tell you where you know each project has a foundation right and and i i maybe began to present myself by seeing i by saying i am i have been trained architect but not all my projects can exist in architecture. And I think that the main, where, where they does not exist in architecture, where there is no ground for them to exist. And in that sense, the ground of this project is very much questioning 
the, 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 na the, the main notions of the capitalist world we are living in, which means be suspicious towards the public and the private. And I will shortly explain what does that mean for me, and then show you a film and then move to Zoe. You know, I, when I have been trained architect in Venice, in Italy, we were taught that, you know, if we will design the public, if we will design plazas, we are good architects because we are contributing to the civic place, we are contributing to the building of society, etc., etc. While if we will design the house of our grandparents or the house of our uncles, we are a little bit of a less engaged architects, right? So, and departuring from this, I returned back to Palestine. I am Palestinian and, and went to Italy to study architecture. And when I returned to Palestine, my mission, I thought at least, my mission was to think that, you know, we should build a Palestinian public without thinking what does it mean to build a public under occupation, without thinking what does it mean that your enemy is your public, right? Is your enemy is what actually control your public, right? And, and it did not even stop there. You know, arriving there, the first project we began to do as DAR was how can we use the Israeli settlements and turn the house of our enemy into our house in the future? You know, th these settlements were built on illegal, illegally internationally. They were built by Palestinian labor. So we thought, why not? We actually think about, even if that is impossible, we think how to reuse them for Palestinians. But suddenly, you know what we would discover? We begin from land ownership. And we immediately realize that the way that Israelis expropriate that land, because there has been before the Israeli arrival, a lot of legal categories that actually define collective beyond the public. And somehow not all collectives in Palestine was run by the state. So there has been a lot of collectives by people, completely self-organized, and suddenly what they would do, maps would be brought and they would put that on the, on the floor and, and everything that people have in common would be designed over and called public. Public is the state, the state is, is Israel, and suddenly the state and in the name of the public, all what people have in common has been expropriated. So this is the first, my first doubt, being suspicious towards the public. Not everything that is public is good, okay? Leave this. I would go to Sweden, and in some way, I would begin to think about it a little bit differently and begin to be doubtful about our relation with the private. In a welfare state like Sweden, where public is embraced, I would arrive there and begin to think about my grandmother. And what did my grandmother did? You know, they, I was in a conference of social housing a few uh, uh, weeks ago, and for us, social housing is only done by the state. And in somehow, I realized how my grandmother was an amazing co-founder of social housing for my family, and I would explain how. I mean, my grandmother would work for 20 years to buy one small piece of land. And you know how many people lived and still be living in that piece of land? a hundred and few more people are living there, and they are all part of my extended family. I have lived there for 15 years. I still have my father, mother lives there, cousins over. You know, it's a place that is over and over and over. Uh, and my, my grandmother managed to owe, and I will, I will insist on owning my grandmother by owning that piece of land, put roots to her family, in a place where displacement of indigenous is a constant act. Now, where I will begin to become suspicious, my grandmother is called in the places where I was educated, what my grandmother bought and owned is called private property, exactly as it's called private property and ownership of 16 apartments of a very rich man in Manhattan that have never even visited these places but gain profit out of it. So at this point I say, you know, my grandmother used private property to put roots. Then private property can be good. 
it's not only bad. So this project is based on how do we today understand two categories through which our society is founded, is founded. How can we understand them not by what they represent and not in an abstract way, but rather for what they are used? And how can we rethink them, reframe them, use them, and try to understand and not to be pre I mean, I, in some way, this, this, this me 20 years ago thinking that the public is good is gone, completely gone. And I think that the Living Room Project is based on these two doubts. And it's based on how can we today reframe categories that we think that if they exist and no way that we can think them differently. So this project that I would show you, and, and unfortunately I cannot show you all the story, I will begin the film from its half and hope, but I, I still wanted to give you a little bit of, uh, of and if you want, if you vis will visit our uh, website, uh, www.decolonizing.ps, you will see the first part. So if you are interested, you can see it. But let's go to that because I want to give you a little bit of a feeling what this project, partially what this project is and then have a, a small uh, Zoe following up and, and a great discussion. The Living Room Project is very much about how to deal with the role of the domestic space within a framework of statelessness. Indeed, when I say statelessness, I don't mean that are only people that are without state legally, but statelessness means people that indeed feel not represented by the state or are not represented in that moment by the state or legally stateless. And in a sense, the, the way they disassociate themselves from the public space or that they do not belong to the public space or that they have hard time accessing public space, the role of the domestic becomes very important for them. And indeed, the Living Room Project is one of these projects that is very much dealing with, if I am stateless, what does it mean for me to be still in collectivity, to create common places, to create places from where I still believe that I belong, I can speak, I can express my perspective, I can express my being, and I can be proud of who I am. <laughs> During the process of the project, we were given a ground floor in the Yellow House, and in this ground floor, we tried to turn it into a semi-square. Indeed, the only architectural intervention that have been done here is to throw all possible walls and to open up to the uh, outside and is one of the corners of the uh, building becoming simply transparent and, and can open itself on both sides. And in good days, it becomes a completely open corridors to the outside and in the cold times it becomes a square through which you see the light and you see people sitting and it becomes almost a light box of square that people are able to see from outside and indeed interact or come in. And it has been working in an amazing way by having Yasmin proposing herself as a host. Yasmin began to come to the living room and began to activate it. And with time, they created what they called the Saturday's rituals. There is a lot of co-hosting or, or offering each other the ability of being hosts because they understand that hosting is power, hosting is visibility, and they are all into this situation where they are kept guests forever as migrants. And I think that they understood that by practicing the right of hosting, it's a way of claiming agency of becoming visible in the city.
هلا انا يمكن اول وثاني مره حسب ما بذكر انا اللي اخترت وانا تعمدت انه تكون من بلدان مختلفه يعني كل اسبوع بلد مختلف يعني لكل واحد يظهر ايش في عنده مثلا وبنفس الوقت حتى لو كان مثلا من نفس البلد انه اشخاص مختلفين كل واحد يظهر بيئته بشكل مختلف حتى فهي اول مره وثاني مره انا اللي اخترت ممكن بس بعد هيك لا الاشخاص هم صاروا يجوا لعندي او يكتبوا لي او شيء انه فينا احنا نطبخ الاسبوع الجاي حابين نطبخ كذا حابين نكون يعني متواجدين بنشارك مثلا هم يعني هم بيحسوا انه هاد يومهم يعني فبدهم يظهروا باحسن ما يكون بغض النظر ان كانوا متواجدين السويديين او مش السويديين الموجودين يعني بس انه كل شخص بحس حاله انه خلص انه هاد يومي يعني ولا بعزم حدا بقول انه مين بده يطبخ المره الجايه وخلص فهو بيتكفل حتى باليوم بيخبر او هاي احيانا انه ايه اذا شفت حدا جديد او هاي بخبر عن المشروع انه نحن هناك فيكم تتفضلوا تواجدوا بس الاشخاص اللي متواجدين وبيعرفوا لا خلص حتى في بعضهم انه صار يوم السبت ما بيرتبط بولا شيء يعني في عندنا يل هاوس في عندنا وظافه لازم نروح ايه فهيك وحتى في رجال انه صارت تشجع المشروع مو بس نسائي يعني في رجال كثير صاروا يطلبوا انه هم يطبخوا انه هم يكونوا يشاركوا في رجال طبخوا يعني فحسيت انه صار الكل يعني انه بده يطبخ بده يشارك بده يكون موجود يعني وكمان مرتين ثلاثه خلينا كمان انه فينا نقول مراهقين او اطفال كمان يطبخوا طبعا باشراف والدتهم يعني بس طبخوا واحد منهم بتذكر كان عمره يمكن 12 او 13 سنه عمل لنا شاورما يعني فكان هيك حسيت انه الكل يعني متشجع انه انا بدي اكون ليش لا انا كمان فيني اعمل شيء فانا يومها تفاجات لما هو طلب مني انه فيني اطبخ قلت له ايه ما في مشكله فعد هو من اول وجديد يعني من من الصفر بلش وقطع الجاج واشتغل فيه من البدايه للنهايه اي وحسيته يعني قبل بيوم انه ستريس انه ثاني يوم ما بيلحق معلش افرم قبل بيوم الدجاج وهي اي فهيك حسيتهم يعني انه بدهم يكونوا جزء ان انديد اي هاف تو سي ذات ان 3 ييرز تايم زي ابسولوتلي مانجد تو بوت ذا ليفينج روم ان ذا ماب ان ذا انستيتيوشنال ماب اوف ذا سيتي اند 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 يو سي ذيم زي ار براود اوف ات زي ايفن بيجان تو انفايت بوليتيشنز ات ا سيرتن بوينت تو برينج ذيم ان ذير space and to show them what they managed to create and there was a sense of proudness of being host and of having their own place where they can invite the rest of the city. جربتوا كثير مرات تعزموا السياسيين انتوا تعزموهم للمضافة بدل ما هم يعزموكم لنشاطاتهم. بتفكري اثر مين اللي عازم مين يعني اثر انه هم من اجوا هون بدل ما انتم تكونوا رحتوا عندهم على البلديه ولا على مؤسساتهم ولا يعني اختلف شيء بطريقه بالعلاقه هو ما اختلف شيء بالعلاقه بس يمكن نحن اللي كسرنا الحاجز هلا اكيد واحد لما بيكون هو المستضيف فبحس نقطه القوه مثلا عنده بايده يعني ايه فلما انت مثلا بتقعدي انت تشرحي بصير دورك مثلا كلاجة انا بدي اشرح هلا انه هي قوانيني انه انا ببلدي مثلا كنت هيك انه احنا كنا ناكل هذا ايه هلا بجوز انه هو ما بيعني شيء للشخص المقابلك بس هو بيعني لك لك انه انت اعطيتيه شيء او نقطه او شيء نظره عن الشيء اللي عشتيه قبل يمكن هو بيعني لك كثير مثلا ممكن يعني لك كثير انه اشرب فنجان القهوه مع هيل يعني بجوز هو عم يتذوقه لاول مره بجوز ما عجبه يعني بس بالنسبه لي يعني عم بشرح له انه فنجان القهوه مع الهيل بيعني لي كثير And, and in this, I, I will actually pass to Zoe because I think that our conversation together departure from a sort of anger that I had the moment that the migration office would decide to close that place that in first place was commissioned by the public art agency, which means by a, a public uh, uh, institution. And it was in the same moment that Moderna Mosette was, was acquiring this project. So it was really a moment where the public was opening, closing, and preserving all together. But it was all an, a decision that was taken beyond really a sort of 
me having in, in some way being able to interfere in these, in these sort of decisions. So when I called Zoe, I told her, you know what? I will never ever do any project where the public is holding the space where I am putting my energy. How can I ever trust again that I would begin a project and then it would be closed by the migration office? And you know what? All the people that worked with me in this project commissioned me says, for democracy, we cannot interfere in each other's businesses. So in somehow, I don't know, there, I, I had a moment of anger that I shared with Zoe and I'm still sharing and has been amazing to process all this and yet only to end, it is not the, the only living room that, that was done. I, I had uh, more than f five living rooms that were created after that and all of them created a complete different stories. But maybe we will today concentrate on, on that one and, and maybe, uh, having Zoe opening up for why she thinks what she thinks about this project. So just in case anyone's unsure about what we just watched, this is a migration center in a once military town in Sweden. It processes unwanted people. And Sandy was given a room in this building to start a community that was owned by the community to carry out their own actions of reprieve. It was where they shared meals. It's where they got together to have a cup of coffee. It's where they would return to the places that they were ejected from. It was meant to be a space of coming together to remember who they are and in turn, they invited some of the most powerful people in the city to come and share a meal, which changed the relationships of them being guests to hosts. And this is absolutely crucial to the Living Room Project of what Sandy Halal has done, and as she's just mentioned, has toured to not only such sites as you've seen, but also to sites heavily indoctrinated in the hegemony of art. So we're sitting right now in a university started by one of the most incredible Renaissance masters. It's ironic that this is holding sculpture. And yet we're talking about people as the medium of artists. So how do you call this art? Is what I first come to ask myself when I'm working in these kinds of projects. To what extent is this material deserving of art, and how does it set up a certain pedagogy to which the 21st century can learn, as you've noted that this course is somewhat trying to address. For me, I'm a massive lover of theater. Is there anyone else in the room that loves theater? What about watching cinema, right? Now, those are cultural forms where we sit in front of a stage and we understand we're the audience. And we're taken on journeys as we're watching these cultural forms. I, for one, used to visit theatre but dance when I lived in London. And I loved going to the rehearsals. I would find myself getting really attached to certain dancers who were failing. And I loved watching these dancers come together in a matter of what went wrong? Why am I struggling with this part of the narrative? Why can't my body move? And as a consequence of constant discussion and sharing, this one particular Congolese dancer in London became a star of the particular company. And it was amazing to attend the rehearsals and see him in a finality of performance at the end. Over time, I came to realize that this space of dialogue for a practitioner in the arts is an incredibly powerful space to which we hone our skill. What we are seeing with the living room, and dare I say even with Trampoline House, is the power of that dialogic, the power of speech, the power of being given the chance to see yourself in someone else's eyes. And you're asked to self-reflect and say, 
Who am I? And where do I matter? And for whom? Now for me, where in the world are we given the space to think like this today? Is it in our courtrooms? Is it in our newspapers? Is it in our social media? Is it in our classrooms? I dare to say it is not. The only place left is culture. So when I look at someone like Sandy when she's creating her living room, these are incredibly fragile spaces to which culture is the only way that we can start to engage the other. Because we have to understand in our 21st century, we wake up and we don't understand how the first thing we are trying to diagnose with ourselves is fear. And we will put all manner of tools and gadgets in front of us to elide that fear. And we'll listen to dominant stories in order to try and find a sense of likeness. And that is what we find today the most satisfying aspect of life, is finding that likeness. But what I find enthralling with projects like The Living Room, difference and a sense of being taken out of your expected assumptions, is where you gain a sense of trust. And that irony is something that we need to manipulate, not, we need to kind of mass market it in some way, because we don't know how to accept difference anymore. And so these projects, including Trampoline House, are such valuable spaces for culture today to continue to learn from. And if art and culture cannot be that, it saddens me greatly because when I look at these sculptures in this room, they once were how we learnt about emotion through the human body. But now we actually need to learn about emotion through speech because we have become citizens indoctrinated by images. But those images are too sadly losing context far too quickly. So for me, this is a very important set of equations to teach. The medium of the 21st century can no longer be only what is tangible. It must engage what is intangible before it starts to dominate us, before our virtuality starts to really govern who we say we are. I'll leave it there for now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we've seen how um, Trampoline House went into relationship with a big institution like Documenta. Now I hear that Living Room went into a relationship with another big institution, the Moderna Museet. Could you elaborate a little bit, Sandy Orzoe, on how this weird relationship basically yeah. started and, and, and what the consequences are for yeah, the, the roots uh, organization that you kind of build up? Yeah, I mean, it is, it's, thank you for actually raising thing, I, that, that, that question, because I think it stays at the heart of, of the living room. So when, when in temporary, af, uh, you know, after two years of, of having the living room in, uh, in uh, uh, Boden up there, I activated the living room in the Van Abe Museum through an ex exhibition. And there was a moment that, you know, we were talking about preserving the living room and what does that mean because it actually represents the history of that place, so how can we preserve it? And I was always troubled because this was the first time indeed, you know, as Dar, we, we have never been part of the market, but this was maybe the first time and we were a bit discussing this, me and Zoe, maybe because in a moment when we moved to Sweden, I, in, in uh, and especially, I, I'm working with my husband, and in Sweden, they put almost a no-no on us working as married couple together. And, and in some way, I mean, the, a, a modern society like Sweden decided that a, a, a strong separation between private and public should be, and that me working with my husband can be seen as nepotism, right? So, in somehow, it gave us a little bit of a strange space, and this was maybe the first time where I began to do a project alone, and suddenly, it's possible to acquire this project. And, you know, first of all, this was the first, so I, and, and as I explained to you, I mean, I moved by doubts, but not because I am a very optimistic person, but I think that my optimism comes each time that my doubts would lead me in an intuitive way to somewhere else where I can see a possible different world, where it's possible to, 
So there was this moment where there has been a long discussion on how to acquire the living room. And I have to say that I was a little bit stuck until the closure of that project comes from an up-down uh, 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 position. And I thought, yeah, I, at this point, I have absolutely to write this story in Moderna Musette because this is my only way to react, not in only angry way, but in a, in a way where at least this story would be preserved. But then with Zoe, we write what would be my next living room in Sweden. But I will not speak about it because I would like to deal with the acquisition. So what is it that I owe and the museum can acquire from me in such situation? And I thought about it for long in somehow, and then I realized that the only sort of thing that I can give to the museum is my version of the story. Only my version of the story. And I will tell you in Arabic, to, uh, you speak, when, you, when you use the word, so there is more than a word to say story, one is riwaya, which means giving water. So in somehow when you tell a story, you are giving water to other people, grow other people, imagination, minds. But also the same Arabic says that a story is a cutting act. There is a scissor, it's used by the origin of the scissor, and there is a cutting. You, you cut something when you tell a story. And this something is your part of the story, right? So I decided that people will not go to the museum and see the living room project or witness or understand what is happening in the living room project. The people will go to Moderna Mosette, sit in my living room as an artist or as an architect, sitting in my sofa on what was in this moment few objects that I had, hear that story that I told, because this is not Yasmin's story. This is, even if Yasmin is part of it, but this is my story. Maybe one day Yasmin will tell her story, but this is not Yasmin's story. This is my version of the story. How many of you have love stories, and when you tell the first time you met your lover, you have two different stories? Many of us. So it's not, I'm not, and my problem with artists thinking that their story is the story is, is the biggest, in, because this is the authorship. You know, the authorship comes out of the fact that you tell my story is the story. Everybody else needs to be included in your story. And this is sometimes where, of course, when we speak about such project, it becomes problematic, it becomes an issue. So Moderna Mosaic, what you will witness when you go in, you will enter in my living room, and I will tell you a story I lived in this period of time in Budin. My anger, my notes, my... But it's my story, and I keep it to myself because this is the only thing I own. So, and, and, and somehow, it is very much linked for me at this point, and because there has been many living rooms, then they began to, uh, to be. And it really felt to me like the, the, the closest example to this is the Thousand and One Night story, where a closure of a story is to begin a new one. You know, she will be killed if she will not make the closure in new opening. So, and somehow I think this whole idea of closing is in order to be open, is in order to tell the day after a new story. So, and somehow each time the museum or a place would acquire, it would acquire a closure in order to open up for an opening. So I think this is a little bit the way that this project is, is, uh, is being preserved and acquired. Okay, thank you, clear. Uh, what strikes me in both stories is that uh, both initiatives uh, were raised from uh, a caring uh, with weak people in contemporary Western society, migrants, asylum seekers, and, and sh uh, supporting them and helping them and giving them a platform. But both um, projects ended up in the art world, like in Documenta or in the Moderna Musée, uh, platforms that are considered to be very exclusive and very um, elitist even, even Documenta, even the last version was elitist, I think, in many ways, as is Moderna Museet. How do you see uh, this, uh, do you see this as a paradox? And in what way did you and your projects change those institutions? How did you change Documenta? And how did you or will you change uh, the museum as a medium and an institution? 
Because there's a lot of power involved there as well, eh? in, in Documenta and in Moderna Museet. I think it remains to be seen how uh, Documenta has changed, because um, I know there's a lot of people in Germany who wants to change it back. <laughs> it was uh, quite um, like a public discourse uh, during the 100 days. But I do think that um, what was interesting about uh, uh, Ruan Gruber's proposal was to change the idea of uh, authorship uh, because of the collective um, uh, production process and this idea of, that, you know, we don't need a single author anymore. And I think, uh, like to me, it rings a bell because we have been working for 12 years um, skipping this uh, like patriarchal authorship because we've re we realized that this moment I was talking about before, like the zone of becoming, that happens, it, it works better if you skip the uh, power play around uh, like the egotist notion of who, who is uh, the owner of this or that. And, and if you enter in this uh, space of mutual respect, and then um, uh, start to play around. And me personally, I mean, used to be a painter, and I used to have like um, a big ego as a painter. <laughs> you need a big ego to be a painter because it's a very lonely business. And uh, <laughs> you know, I'm sure somebody knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> so for me, um, it was such a, a it was such a revealing experience to, uh, to lose this artistic ego and in, instead, in my case, gain artistic integrity in the collective. And I'm not saying that this is the only way to produce art, not at all. I love painting and I also love uh, uh, like painters. <laughs> but but I'm saying that, that uh, I think in general, if you look about where art is going, um, I think we are way behind in the general art world because in, in the business, you know, where people are, if you get a Nobel Prize these days, there's always like three people who get the prize together. It's because right now people have realized that it's a good idea to work together. And I think that uh, what we have achieved in Tramplin House uh, we have only achieved because we have hundreds of authors. I never felt, you know, although I was director in Trampen House, I never felt that uh, I, I had any claim to uh, the authorship of what's going on. We are, we are nursing a process. It's like growing carrots. You have to be patient, and then you have to allow people to, uh, to step in and create. And I was talking about this creation, I mean, uh, like how for each individual to, I mean, this is the creation. That is the moment where you, where you are enter the zone of becoming and you're actually able to, to uh, start imagining and to step out of the framing that you have been given and to, um, you know, to, uh, to reinvent yourself. Lots of people need that. Uh, lots of Danes need that. Uh, and that's, I guess that's why we never uh, lack volunteers, uh, not from the camp and not from, uh, from the uh, city. Um, so back to your question, how, um, how, this is, uh, how this has affected us. Um, for me, it's, it's been really nice to, to get this focus on the multiple authorship. Uh, and I'm hoping that it is going to change uh, the art world uh, to sort of ease up this uh, patriarchal idea of, uh, of the, the uh, singular author. Um, what it did for Tramplin House, it, I mean, sometimes it was almost tearing us apart because of the problem that half of us could not travel. Uh, it's a really, you know, because we are trying every day to uh, to support this idea of equality, and it's kind of not really possible because people have so uh, different uh, rights. Uh, but then we could sort of engulf ourselves inside the house because we set the rules that okay, uh, we have this kind of uh, uh, everybody has agency in Trump and House. 
and uh, we are not there to help anybody. Actually, we always ask the, Trump, the uh, uh, refugees from the camps to help us. It's not like we are a charity. They help us because we have a problem with our democracy. They're the only ones who can help us. So, so and that's, you know, with this uh, knowledge and this understanding of what we are doing, um, it was actually a strain to go to Kassel. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, we felt we have to do it because it's the biggest microphone we'll ever get. Um, and uh, we convinced enough people to join. And, and I think nowadays it's better because there was a lot of doubt whether, you know, where are these videos going and what do we, why do we show our faces? And you know, people are getting worried. Um, and now that we came back and we have time to show them, suddenly everybody wants to take part in the next movie. <laughs> So, so there's, and also, you know, uh, like in uh, in Shakira's case, she, w I mean, she's from the camp herself, and they produced actually, they produced the best um, uh, video for documenta, way better than uh, than the one that I'm responsible for. <laughs> So in a way, um, um, Documenta helped to, to restart Trampoline House and give it a new, an afterlife or a new life, basically. Yeah. Could well you say that, that way? Um, uh, you know, I think they were, they actually in the way that, that uh, we were really depressed, I mean, to lose, uh, to go bankrupt, I don't, anybody who's tried it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it feels like life threatening. Your whole existence is kind of at odds. And then to be invited at documents at the same time is kind of okay, but we're not going to die. There's a, tim there's a fleet, like a timber fleet, I think it's called. We, we jump that, and then we see what happens. Uh, and then uh, when we were in this stormy uh, waters, uh, uh, realizing, oh, we are floating. We're floating towards castle. <laughs> then then uh, at the same time, we were able to reboot uh, the new smaller house. So I th you can say that it's true that uh, it gave us, uh, it energized the project. Can I ask? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the question, but I have to disagree about <laughs> the, the fact that Documenta is um, an elitist uh, uh, context. It is, but the contents were not. And this this was really a great difference also regarding Champlain House. Who is using whom? Is Documenta using Champlain House or is Champlain House using Documenta? This is always the question also inside the house. Who is helping whom? Are Danish or European citizens helping refugees asylum seekers or are refugees asylum seekers helping? us and the word helping we try to avoid that very much is not the fact of helping is the fact of participate to really construct the conditions in which participation is possible we were discussing a lot uh, among ourselves is also in the publication the difference uh, uh, among belonging and participating Be belonging is rooted it's something that's come with a heavy luggage. Participation is really urgent, is need uh, for people that are, have not access to the public sphere to participate and Documenta is a great public sphere, space. This is why we discuss a lot and we have decided to use that a lot. And also regarding what documenta in which terms it was really different from the other for example we have a seed found it, it was something that each collective can spend uh, directly in our own uh, location without explaining why and we have decided to use that as a solidarity found so that everyone in very urgent and needs have access to that money what what is that is that a great opportunity? Is that the way in which the curator themselves have struggled a lot in order to loop, loophole the bureaucracy of a very traditional institution in order to subvert some system from the inside? It's not, this is not visible in the exhibition itself, but this has produced many interesting discussions 
and process among ourselves that are so useful in order to do it again, probably, no? And also the question that trampoline house is embodying a border also within documenta. You have seen there is a circle that the, the public uh, have decide to cross or not. So to enter into this embodying border that is the uh, <laughs> what Champlain House represents, uh, it is inside a colonial European territory, still ne neoliberal and colonial. And in the other hand, it means that there is an encounter with people arriving from this global south. So the big uh, differences and different privileges are really embodied every day in which both the communities can try to uh, construct alternatives. This was also what Documenta, I think this is my personal opinion, but we can discuss about that, have represented this year. Okay, sure. Um, Zoe? Word is yours about the relationship between living room museum, and then we will go to the audience in order to have them react and respond and ask. Yeah. I want to try and answer this question personally before I get to Sandy. When I was a child, I used to visit my own regional museum, which in my world was my world. And as a Chinese British immigrant family, I would walk around this museum's collection and I would say to my mother, I can't see my family on these walls. And then I would go to the State Museum in Sydney in Australia and similarly I would find myself walking around this collection and again, I can't find my family history on its walls. And so I start to ask myself, what is the purpose of collections that attempt to draw some form of narrative about the past? And then I found my mother taking me to even more historic collections about China. And I found there was a lot missing from the daily life of a Chinese citizen from what I'm seeing of these exhibitions. And so I start to question, what is the purpose of collecting? Why do museums collect contemporary art, and what gets in and what does not. And ultimately, what is the purpose of a collection in the future for, say, someone in 2050 visiting the Musée de Musette? What are they seeing about 2022? Yes, it's a space of elitism, but public collections are there for anyone to walk in. The onus is on the public to walk in and make up their own stories from what they see or ask questions about what they are not seeing. It also makes me think about an Argentinian theoretician, philosopher, his name is Walter Mignolo. Some of you may know him. He is rather the king of thinking of decoloniality. And he has this study which says in order for us from the so-called once colonized territories to speak back, we have to de-link from its narrative and re-link with an understanding of our own legacies. So how do we re-link? Now, by the Musée de Musette choosing to acquire something as quite radical as a living room, is a very progressive decision to say this is representative of 2022. Mm. Now, as an artist, it was an incredibly difficult decision for Sandy to agree to this. Indeed, it sent her through tunnels of doubt and confusion and self-assessment as to what it means to come from a place of struggle with that dominant art hegemonic network, knowing that she feels very, very uncomfortable with it. But she also understands that one day there may be a once immigrant 
enter the collection of the Musée du Musette and can see that they belong. And that is an incredibly powerful thing for a museum to do, but it's even more powerful for an artist to let go. For an artist to let go of a work into a collection isn't easy. For an artist, particularly in a social engaged practice where they realize that the stories they are representing may not be their own. And you've heard Sandy already doubly reaffirm that what she is allowing to be acquired is her story. But in acquiring this, someone else can activate it on their own terms. And that's part of the nature of this particular acquisition. And dare I say, this was not an easy acquisition for this museum. It was in itself a radical proposal. And that in itself suggests a relinking and a suggestion that Walter would say, we must understand how can we change the terms of the conversation. And that's what this piece has done by entering the collection. It's changed the terms of the acquisition. It's changed the terms to which people and their memories can be acquired. OK, thank you very much, Claire. Then we turn to the audience. I would also like to say that also Nico and Judith are part of the panel. So if you have any questions regarding their decision to invite uh, the two projects, these questions can also be asked, of course, huh? and then its relationship to the art school as we know it. Huh? So, who wants to break the ice? Now the rain has stopped. Zoe, I have a question for you. So you talk about storytelling, which uh, I find interesting, and also that's something that uh, keeps recurring. Somehow in this space, people keep talking about the importance of storytelling. And um, I wonder what's your take on that in terms of if we look, let's say, 500 years back, and you look at storytelling as in uh, the classical Catholic Christian narrative storytelling type of thing, which is being a, an oppressive story, right? Um, and then we have, yes, suddenly I'm, I'm taking a jump to, to the 20th century, just like that. Um, and we talk about abstract art, which is like the color is the color, that there is nothing more to it, no more story. So, in a way, it's like a gesture of abandoning the story. And then suddenly, 20, like, jump back forward, 21st century, again, here we are talking about the importance of storytelling. So how do we relate to one another? What happened in between? Um, I know it's a bit speculative, but no, I no. wonder what you I'm have open to for say. the challenge. I think it's important to understand that what happened in that leap that you're just trying to allude to. The 21st century holds the highest number of diasporic voices to date. Those diasporas see First Nation peoples in bed literally with those of utter privilege. We see myself, my family are 1947 refugees ejected out of a China into Hong Kong and my last name in Cantonese is Bud, but thank you British imperialists upon entry point at the port, they said, what is your name, sir? Bud, they say, oh, right, B-U-T-T. -T. Thank you very much. That was quite a, you can imagine what, what I went through as a child. But nevertheless, what I'm trying to say is we see a confluence of narratives as a consequence of those migratory patterns that have more and more become enforced, not voluntary. So with those storytellings, particularly that are on, involuntary, they are not documented. Voluntary movement means we've been accepted, we've arrived, we've been welcomed, and we have the voice to speak. 
Unvoluntary movement means you have to be accepted into the terms of which your host demands, often at a rate of invisibility, lack of rights. We don't have speech. And what we see more than any other era is the importance of oral histories. We only have to study First Nation memories to understand how important orality is, predominantly because their presence has been diminished, unwanted, in a constant state of enforcement. So storytelling comes to an incredible fore now, today, because we're also in the era of mass social media. Unlike no other time before, we wake up and the first thing we do is we grab our phones and we start thinking, what's the story of the day? Indeed, we have Instagram stories, we have Facebook stories. The word has become a catch-all phrase. But most of the time, we think only of telling stories through images. And the context with images can be too easily lost. And that's why you find more and more artists today giving context back through dialogue. Because they understand, particularly artists like Sandy, as a Palestinian, understands that speech is where dialogue can be reflected in multiple perspectives. Stories that she sees will be fed back to her in other perspectives from someone else. And that is where the power of storytelling is at its ultimate. Because we have to be able to read the other in that moment. To me, that's my personal take on why storytelling is incredibly important. Not to mention that, just to go back to your mention of abstraction, that was coming out of a very political moment of a geopolitical state of the Cold War. And you have to understand that was a very Western response to the market at that time. So we, we have to understand that particular moment. Good question. Okay, good answer as well, I suppose. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any more questions, reactions, statements, suggestions, ideas popping up? to be shared. Okay, is there, there's a microphone, Nico. Yeah, like would you say that uh, working or cooperating with this museum that exhibited uh, these social rooms actually also raised the interest or the engagement uh, for arts within these social groups we were working with? In what way uh, did the museum's relationship with these new kind of art forms also raise attention yep. of the audience to the groups you are working with? Like a social effect? Uh, no, what I mean is like these social groups. I don't, if, I don't know if I got it right, but how much were they engaged before in like arts? Because I, as I saw, it was like a social um, project in general. Um, but like, just with now being uh, presented in this museum and in at Castle, that did that start like an an interest within the people of these social groups you were working with um, in art? Uh, I think I, I think I have at least something to say about this. Uh, your question. Uh, Actually, I, you know, because now uh, uh, taking off from the storytelling problem. Um, is this better? <laughs> Thank you. Um, the, um, uh, with your, uh, Zoe was talking about um, the storytelling part. And for me, the reason why stories are important is that uh, when we are in uh, Tramplin House, we are actually looking to create a new kind of culture that is able to allow all these people to uh, uh, be together and to learn from each other and to, uh, and to uh, create together, to create a new culture together. And uh, I don't know how to uh, support a story in a better way than to uh, build a story a common story. So this is something about communicating and, uh, and sharing, and then uh, realizing what 
we share and how we can uh, move on. So in that sense, this process is really important. Then to take that to a museum, I'm actually a bit hesitant towards this idea. And the, like if, because uh, this is a fragile process. <laughs> you don't need an audience to, uh, to judge you while we are creating this culture. And this is also why we, uh, for a long time, uh, have been um, uh, uh, arguing that we need our own house, our own institution, because um, it's, the, it's the territory which is important if you want to uh, uh, like uh, create a democracy. I don't know if anyone here has heard about a democracy that doesn't have a territory. Usually, there are territories that support democracies um, the problem is then that there's also the border around and if you skip from democracy to culture, it's actually the same kind of border, any culture, any group. If you are uh, friends in the academy here, there's like four people that are really uh, good friends. They start to have their own um, language and it's exclusive. So uh, any culture will be uh, partly exclusive. But it's necessary also to build this culture in order to realize who we are ourselves. But the question is, does it become too, uh, does it become a sect? <laughs> or does it become like Denmark, where we decide to put people in camps if we find them on the border? Um, um, this process, it, I don't think it should be uh, subjected to um, a museum. I don't think it belongs there. I think it's a, it's a way too revolutionary <laughs> to exist in a museum. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, yes, so the question of being artist of, or of the art uh, has been a central question for the participation of to document itself. This is why, where is the art group? was created inside the Lumbun discussion, the big question that everyone uh, attending documenta were posing. So, okay, these are practices uh, into the social field or into the artistic field, where is the art? But the main question is, what is art? What do we intend the meaning of art, probably, and how can a person define herself or himself an artist or not? In the very case of Trampoline House, there was nothing to invent. Everything was there. And maybe the very question is, and I was thinking uh, and talking about participation before, how can we create the conditions in which uh, users of the house, both artists or not, can participate in this very process towards documenta and to um, become visible and to give visibility to everything that was going on. Is this art? Uh, yes, because he is working in one autonomy field. We were speaking with uh, Sandy and Zoe today about having the autonomy within the art field. Maybe this is the meaning, because it's not possible in the society to have trampoline house. This doesn't work into politics, uh, not even into our democracy, not uh, in the economics. It's prohibited as a space, but it, it, it it, it is happening into the art field. So everyone that is participating in this very project is part of that. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I mean, if I may ans try to answer your question, I mean, honestly, it's not, I, I am not interested in people visiting the museum. This, this might be the, the museum director task. It might be, you know, my, I, I had a complete different uh, task to do. And somehow for me, when I arrived to Sweden and began this project, I asked myself, 
if I am coming to live in Sweden and in somehow want to live there and belong in dignity, what are my options? And you know, I, I will bring you back. I lived in Italy for 13 years, and they told me that if I would behave and be a perfect citizen, I will become one of them. And I tell you, I ticked all the boxes. You know, I speak Italian perfectly. I love cooking Italian food. I love an Italian man. I have two half Italian daughters. I push the family always to go to Italy because I miss Italy. Yet, Italian, I have never became. Right? So I arrived to Sweden, and my question, okay, if, like this, I did not become Italian, would I ever be able to become a Swede? No. So what are my strategies of belonging? Because for many reasons, I cannot now live in Palestine because as family, we didn't obtain family reunion, so I have to live in Sweden. Yet as a person and with a dignity, I thought I would like to live in Sweden thinking about my strategies of belonging. First thing that comes to me when I arrived to Boden, because I was afraid to, it was not only them, that were afraid of belonging or how to belong. It was my problem that I needed to figure out. So I would come up in the north and realize that in a way people are kept guests forever. You know, the fact that why I was afraid to go and live in Sweden. I mean, once my father says, why, you know, everybody wants to go to live in these happy welfare state societies. Why are you afraid? And when I asked myself, why am I afraid in living in this society? I was afraid to be kept guest forever. And you know, in so many cultures, in Arabic cultures, there is a, 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 a say said that hospitality is for three days. After that, it becomes charity. So I didn't want to be a charitable subject in society. No, I did not want that. So if I do not want to become charity, what happens the fourth day? I am in Sweden. So I began to think, how can I become not only guest, but a host, right? So in that sense, why I am bringing this to the museum? I am not bringing this project to the museum for it to bring refugees inside. I mean, if this would be the thing, I had done everything bad. I am not, this is not my task. I'm not interested who are the audience. This is a whole other people's problem. It's not mine. What I want to do is to inspire everyone that ever for any chance would see this project to think, is it true that I am kept guest forever? Can I act on this? You know, only among my group of friends, a lot of time now when we invite each other, they would say, you know, I, I, I love to host because I like power and I know, I mean, it's something that I do a lot and I realize as Dar, as our practice, we were constantly hosting and I thought this is from where we got our power and sometimes I got teased by my friend. No, it's our time to get that power. You know, it's, you create a language in some way, and this is exactly what I am interested in. I'm interested in inspiring anyone. You know, there, I, the, at a certain point, I had this encounter with one of the women that is considered in 2013 the strongest Swedish woman, and yet she came to me and she says, I got so inspired by the Living Room Project because when I was following my husband diplomat and I was a follower uh, uh, wife, I. I intuitively began to host in my living room and by seeing your project, I realized and understood why as a Y follower, even if I am white, even if I am strong and even if I am rich, there is a moment of my life that I needed to host in order to exist. So this is not a project. If you are understanding this, a project about refugees, it is not for me. This is a project for us to question 
how are we constantly moving between guests and hosts? And that means, are we constantly transforming power structure? Or there is a government, like the Danish government, that decided we are the only hosts here, and you all obey to our uh, rules and regulations. And among them, not only refugees, but Danish citizens. There's a moment that the Danish citizens were taking the right to host refugees in their cars and in their houses. The right to be a host was taken also from Danish white citizens. So for me, this is not a project about neither bringing refugees in the museum, neither creating a space for refugees to be together. These might be consequences of what is that is it. I'm, I'm questioning what kind of society we want to build today. This is what I wanted to preserve in Moderna Mosaic. I wanted that once in 10 years time, or 50 or 100, people will come and say, yes, in this, in this moment of our life, we were struggling of what belonging means. Yes, it is. I mean, I'm struggling with what does it mean to be for me a guest forever. Any society that wants only to teach me how to behave. It's a struggle, and I want this to be in the museum, not that, you know, I want to be a good girl and bring refugees in the Moderna Mosaic. Moderna Mosaic, among all. I mean, not okay. my task. Clear enough. <laughs> Any more questions, reactions, suggestions, things you would like to share before we maybe start wrapping up a little bit? Okay. There you go. Hi. Um, yeah, it's not a question, but I would just like to share that. Um, so, in general, when produ producing actions and thinking how to involve people and what that means to involving people into a certain space and why we even need exhibition places in the end and what the purpose is of art, like why do we do what we do and why do we have to show it? Um, Tonight it became really clear why it's so important to do it still, because um, with all the answers you gave tonight, it became clear that through the actions that you um, propose and that you, um, yeah, that you activate and how you activate the spaces and that not only staying where you are and where it's important that you are, but also bringing them to other places that this, um, yeah, that the audience that you gain by this and um, the attention that you get by the government, um, that's actually the purpose or like the reason why you have to continue doing it, right? So um, it's never been so clear to me. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, super, thanks. Um, finally, I would like to give the floor to uh, Judith. Okay because um, it's Judith and Nico who invited uh, our guests for tonight, and I suppose they had a reason for doing so. Yeah. So how does this all touches upon Expanding Academy? First of all, thank you that Expanding Ex Academy could host uh, these wonderful projects and, and artists and curators. Thank you, Johan, for allowing us to do that. And uh, Martin, thank you, Sarah, Sandy, and Zoe. We are really happy to have you here. So Expanding Academy is a project, is a space that in a certain way, as uh, Sandy was very well saying, is reflecting. We want to, to give a space to reflect together students, researchers, uh, teachers, hosts, uh, and people uh, coming from uh, very different contexts and fields. In, in, to, to reflect on, on, in, on what kind of society we want we, we to live in and to build together. And I think it's very interesting also that we, had, uh, that we, we want to give this space also uh, to, to, to the students that they can reflect also on how they want to engage with urgencies of our time. And I think today we, we could uh, get an insight also about this project, this long-term project that are initiated by artists and very, uh, very often by artists, not by institutions, which is quite interesting. Also, both of these artists, it was, came, um, uh, was born out of a desire that the artists, the artists wanted to engage with these very, very complex topics. And I liked also because uh, I'm coming, uh, I'm a curator that is, uh, uh, was researching in the last uh, 10 years 
really on this kind of long-term projects that were very often developed outside of the institutions. And I tried uh, to, to, to develop a frame, a dialogical frame in between this kind of, of, of practices and museums. And I, I, I like today also that I think it's very interesting because now we are trying to bring these practices for the expanding academy in, into the academy. And it was interesting because who was missing today was in a certain way a director from museum. Because in this way we could also expand these questions also that we, that we were raising very important questions about collections and uh, acquiring uh, policies because this is also um, uh, the, the, the context in which, in a certain way, the, 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 the guidelines are put down. And I think in, the, in this way it's important also to bring this kind of practices and these artists into the academy to discuss with you their methodologies and their uh, context in, and difficulties in which, with which they daily also are uh, uh, confronted. For example, how to work with a museum, how to work with, uh, how to, to find also um, spaces of continuation in a certain way, how to found and how to keep the safety around these kind of spaces, because both of these projects are uh, uh, undergoing through a very vulnerable moment also, where both uh, are reflecting also what kind of uh, space they want to develop for the future in a certain way also to, to continue the project. And so it's very, these are all very important questions. And for us, in this sense also, to bring this discourse in an academy also, not only to think to the art object or the art process that uh, US and artists are developing, but also from the beginning on to, 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 to think also the, 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 the context in which this art process uh, will, ta will take, uh, uh, will live. It's very important because this is also, so this context is, can be invented and can be, is, 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 is changing, it's not fixed. It's not only, the, there are not only the galleries, there are not only the museums, but there can be other manner, many other contexts that you can, in a certain way, also develop with the idea of an art process. So, in this sense, the Expanding Academy want to open up a space for this, for this kind of ref reflections and questions. And uh, Nico, I'm very happy to collaborate on this with Nico because uh, this is a dialogue and this uh, this is a it's a conversation that we are bringing forward since many years and we are trying also to 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 uh, um, create many formats for this kind of uh, uh, of uh, conversation so now he's distributing uh, one of the first um, booklets and publications that we have produced uh, in relation to these practices and to these uh, conversations so we are very happy that you can today have one for free and maybe Nico you want to add something uh, yeah add something to it I think we need I mean I need to go together with Charlotte to the uh, Charlotte already left for the kitchen <laughs> <laughs> because we still prepared a meal for you, so uh, <laughs> to have an after talk. Yeah. Okay, thank you everybody. Thank you dear guests for being here and sharing your experiences and ideas. <laughs> thank you Tom for uh, taking care of the technique. And finally, thank you, dear audience, for being here, being so uh, attentive and sharing your thoughts. We hope to see you back soon. Bye-bye. Take care. <laughs>